Welcome to another episode of the Tasmeem podcast. My name is Mikey Mahanna. This episode is with Hadid Omar and Yasmin Sleiman, who are both professors at VCU Qatar. This episode is about ephemeral versus permanent, which is a um, sort of a wishy-washy title that should make for a good conversation. Um, welcome, Yasmin. And welcome, Hadid. Thanks Thank for you. having us, Mikey. Okay, so Yasmin, maybe let's start with you. Um, how would you describe what you do on a daily basis at VCU? Ooh, okay, we, we're starting tough already. Um, so in addition to uh, being uh, an assistant professor at the school, I'm also, actually my main daily job is um, being the head of the materials library, uh, which is a very unique resource at the school, and it serves the entire community at the university, and we're also open to the public. So my day-to-day -day looks very different every day and every week. And uh, I am in between leading a small team uh, and managing the facility, our spaces, our resources, our collection, developing them, supporting students and faculty on their own projects and research. Uh, so it's a very dynamic day-to-day. -day. <laughs> cool. Hadid, what about yeah. you? Um, well, I uh, teach uh, time-based media in uh, the Art Foundation Department. And uh, so that's kind of covers for the uh, component in uh, foundation years. And uh, sometimes from time to time, I teach uh, visual communications and uh, the master's program. Um, so mainly I'm focused on uh, digital arts, um, uh, storytelling as part of uh, my research and also how I teach students about like digging to find stories within themselves and um, and also on I'm a practitioner so also I'm a new media artist um, when I have time <laughs> but it's also like I do uh, audiovisual installations and uh, audiovisual performances in the Middle East and uh, sometimes also internationally so um, mainly I work with space and time. What was your first uh, Hadid what was your first uh, memory of Tasmeem. When you think about Tasmeem, if you were to go sort of like organize your memories from oldest to first, what is the first one in that Gmail inbox uh, of your memories? My first one, I think in 2007, because uh, I think that the first year I came, um, I think it happened. I don't know if it happened 2007 or 2008. I think that at that time they were still doing it every year. And then uh, they switched it to a biannual, but it's... Um, um, but I remember it was either 2007 or 2008. That was my first experience um, to volunteer. I was part of the student body that was helping out, also um, ushering um, the people that they're coming in and uh, getting an, a very broad introduction to like how to speak about art and design in that region or, e or even like, you know, so internationally. But again, it goes back to like, it was a very early introduction to uh, what we were learning in school and seeing it on a broader scope uh, presented to the public. Uh, so that was uh, pretty cool for a very young kid that it just uh, came, we're still getting to know what his design is. And I had a better idea about arts, but not design. So that was a good introduction. If I were to ask you, Hadira, just to follow up on that, if I were to ask you what design is at that moment, what would you have said? Uh, at that moment, uh, the, the faculty, I think back then, it was all about problem solving and you're just a bunch of problem solvers and you're there, there to like either create problems or like or find solutions for some. But uh, the majority about it was that there is a, a dialogue between you and someone else that they're having that kind of problem and you're trying to solve it with them. Uh, or maybe you create it yourself, so it's your own problem, <laughs> and you're trying to like uh, solve it yourself. But um, definitely now, its design went in so many ways that it's uh, way cooler than that definition that I told you about earlier. Okay, Yasmin, what about you? What was your first um, your first memory of Tasmeem? I think very similar to Hadir. So my first memory was as a student at VCU. Uh, and I think the first one that I attended was the 2008 one when it was still on an annual basis. Um, so I think we've attended several as, as students and then as alumni. And um, 
yeah, so that was my first memory. And, and I, I, I seem to remember as well, like uh, I, being part of the student group that also was responsible for um, introducing uh, one of the speakers, I think, and mm-hmm. getting a lot of training and public speaking mm-hmm. on that. And uh, so, yeah, that was kind of one of my first memories of the event. Do you have a... Um... Do you have a sense of what the student experience is like at Tasmim now and how that's changed over t- 25 years? Um, I would say every year or every edition is different. So because uh, we have different co-chairs, we have uh, different themes, uh, each come with a completely different way and perspective of like how they want to include the students. Mm-hmm. Um, in our year, for example, we wanted the students to, instead of consume and become participants of workshops, they started giving workshops um, with the artists that they were coming to give workshops. So it was like we had them to have this kind of experience. Um, some other um, Tasmims that, as Yasmin said, I I was like uh, presenting and emceeing for some um, others. It's like you get the students to be part of a, a deeper research and then they presented during Tasmim. So I think it depends on the co-chairs and um, I think with the relevance of like why we need students in a conference like that or a festival like that. So it's uh, each edition was definitely mm-hmm. way different. And uh, the students, again, it's sure we can support and give them the opportunity and the platform, but it's up to them how they want to also contribute. So it's like they have to also be motivated and self-driven to like wanting to take that opportunity and um, add to it, not just uh, what we give them. And the earlier yeah. editions of Osmim were sort of um, sort of kind of the typical or um, yeah, the typical kind of academic conference that you think about. So a series of talks, uh, maybe an exhibition, there weren't that many kind of workshops. And then once it sort of stepped into a biennial model, that's when uh, the kind of the programming expanded a little bit. So the experience shifted quite drastically um, from a student experience of of what that event was. So it was no longer kind of rows of seating and kind of watching talks after talk, but it was now a lot more varied and diverse and dynamic as an event. Um, and so, and, and yeah, and in addition to what Hadid was saying, that shifts as well, depending on, on the theme every, every edition. You know, I'm like, I'm really curious about what the design scene like was, what the design scene in Qatar was like in 2007, 2008, when you think back to that moment, how would you describe it? And and Yasmin, let's stick with you. Like, how would you describe what it was like then and how it may or may not have changed? And if you can actually draw direct parallels or connections to Tasmin, that'd be great. Um, So, I mean, I think what's, I mean, thinking of Tasmim also back then and, and it residing in the kind of the, the scene, also the design scene back in like 2007, 2008, Tasmim was sort of the first um, kind of event of its kind that happened in the region that was kind of focusing on art and design. So it was sort of a maverick in that way. And that was really exciting. And it, I mean, the design scene in, in Doha was still very young in the sense that it was mostly encapsulated by the sort of design firms and and uh, sort of private firms and maybe some of the corporate ones that were set up. And beyond that, it was, uh, you know, mostly, uh, you know, what the, what the museums were also um, putting together in terms of their programming. Yeah. So it was much less in terms of, of quantity and, and smaller in scale. Um, and I think through the years, as Tasmim has also kind of grown and sort of changed and shifted and has become more dynamic, I think the scene has also sort of um, mimicked that in a way or in parallel to that has also um, shifted in scale. So it's grown in scale, uh, definitely. And and there's a little bit more variety in the local design scene now um, as a sort of as a result or whether they both affect it, each other. I don't know if I can say that. Uh, but that those are the parallels that I can draw. What about you, Adir? Does any of that sound different than what you experienced? No, my I know that it's um, it was smaller because although it's like it was still um, 
they're trying to understand what its design is, at least in this region. Uh, and definitely it was something that it's new to the region, but at the same time, um, I think we're all now, because of the internet and because of social media and because of a lot of other things, uh, we want more anyway. Even if we don't know now, like how we were like talking about design back then and how we used to like yeah. create platforms for it, and the problems that we were trying to discuss and highlight regarding to design and art that they were tackling, it's so different than now and how we're like, we're okay to like not to know and still give platforms to th things that we're still not sure about like AI and whatever. So it's like, I think it's just, we're the ones who were changing. So that's why, yes, the Smeem changed and that's why you saw more other platforms and also it became not just institutions that they're interested in creating platforms. A lot of individuals also mm -hmm. started to create their own entities to explore that in their own ways and methods and timelines instead of like depending on institutions. So I'm glad that we were exposed to that at a very young age or like at least in Qatar we started to do that. So a lot of us, when we graduated, we were seeking more of these events to happen in other parts of the region and also become more normal for us to like travel and go overseas just for a conference or just to go for an, a festival, whatever, because we were hungry for more of conversations and um, and these kind of intersections regarding to the arts and gender and design. Yeah, you know, it's interesting, like the, the, the subject of today's conversation is supposed to be this idea of um, permanent versus um, ephemeral, right? And with so many of these conferences or festivals or congregations, there is something like um, inherently ephemeral about it, right? Like it sort of, some of it just vaporizes afterwards. Um, I wonder if you can describe, uh, Yasmin, some of the the legacy that is ephemeral, that sort of like vanishes immediately right after uh, tasmeem, any tasmeem ends versus some of the stuff that is permanent um, and has left a lasting legacy. And then I'm curious about that within your own artwork as well. I think in terms of, of what feels very ephemeral or in terms of the legacy of, of the event, uh, I always feel like as soon as the event wraps up, it's like a wedding sort of sometimes, like it, the, the event feels like it's a, a, a really lovely celebration when it's being hosted at the university and, you know, all classes are kind of paused and everyone's participating and attending and, um, and it really feels um, like the entire community comes together and the public and all the visitors that come from abroad. So the the sort of the energy and the vibe and the and the university is is different. It's sort of exaggerated and heightened. And I think that's also part of the ephemeral legacy is as soon as sort of it wraps up and everyone kind of goes back to their uh, corner of the world and and, you know, classes resume again you're left with that kind of like, oh, I wish it was, you know, a few more days longer or, or you know, or like, why can't this be every day? And, um, and so I think the, the feeling that people have, that kind of high that people are riding on during the event is something that um, we all enjoy and then we all very quickly miss once the event wraps up. Um, but in terms of the legacy of, of maybe all the additions, I mean, um, it's really sort of fascinating to see or to kind of consider depending on how many people have attended or uh, and, and who were the talks and and um, I mean the speakers and what kind of programming happened what sticks to someone and what doesn't and it's rather and it's very different from one person to the other and so I think that's sort of um, the best legacy is that you're you, you know Tasmeem as an event is trying to present a buffet of options and ultimately you sort of pick and choose whatever of that program you really, uh, you know, click with. And then everyone has that kind of their own Tasmeem experience in that way. Um, and it's lovely to hear about these conversations and what people really resonated with and what they didn't. And I think um, it's sort of like, it's an opportunity for the sort of international community to come in and sort of be a part of our design community in Qatar and to kind of take a little bit of that and take it back to wherever they are. Uh, and I think that also has to ultimately be part of the, part of the legacy of the event as well. Uh, Hadid, what about you? Like, 
this idea of some of the things that are that are end up being permanent. They end up, especially now, like these the those memes every two years. Like it, you know, like it starts. It's like the circus that starts and then closes shop. Like what actually stays permanently at VCU or in Doha or in Qatar more broadly? Like what legacy, like actual day to day, um, yeah structures do you feel like are permanent physical or non non physical structures um i think the the community stays um the the conversations like i think these type of events or um like you bring people in to like give them the excuse to like mingle and they have to kind of let go of like their daily things that they worry about and they come and they just talk based on their interests or based on their backgrounds of whatever they want to talk about it's just like something that triggered them to like ask a question um and um these things that i think are what makes um a conference or whatever is like when you turn it into an experience and you turn it mm -hmm. into something that you want to relate to not just on a academic or just professional level but more like you know it's like it hits something in you like you know either your own concerns or your own um curiosities and you see people that even if they're not exactly sharing these kind of things but they kind of you have the same vibes and you're like you come together and uh you're like okay so it's not just me there are like more people that they are uh they're sharing that and Tasmeem since day one I experienced it uh it became an experience for me it became a celebration it became at the time to like be loose and you know it's like whatever you feel like your your research uh, or your like mind at you're just like maybe you might find someone that can help you with and uh i met producers i met people that now i collaborate with you know it's like and um that's kind of the networking also that we need as our the, in the arts community that it's like we are uh we try as much as we can to create these kind of things because we're very shy people and it's not that easy to like, you know, it's like find collaborators and find people to talk to. So I think this is something that it's permanent, but it's not some something tangible, something that you can measure it. But at the same time, uh, if you ask anyone, they will definitely felt it, experienced it, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. How does like, Hadid, how has this actually changed your your work, right? Like, how has your work yeah. actually changed over the last it, decade or so? It, it changed drastically uh, because of the fact that I found people that trust me and trust uh, my brain. And they're like, okay, we want to work with you. Or like, we, we have something in common. Maybe we have something to offer you and you have something to offer us. So let's do that kind of exchange. Maybe we uh, were you curious together about the same technology or the same uh, questions. Uh, we're all angry, maybe. You know, it's like there is something that we want to react to. So it's uh, this is what brings us together. And um, I was before maybe a little bit more uh, scared to like open up and tell people like I really not I don't know that much about like maybe that sort of um, technology or how to do things or. Well, I'm not that much of an artist, but maybe even I'm not that much of a designer. So I'm like stuck in the middle kind of, and I, I, I was interested in everything. So it, uh, it made it harder to sell, you know, whatever you want to sell, you know, it's like, so, and I think these type of events and, um, when you meet people that they are also, maybe they're confident in some things and there are so many other things that they're not confident in. And then you kind of like come and like, you come like a puzzle and uh, you get to uh, find something together that you're interested in together. It's like definitely made me more collaborative, made me more patient. Teaching also helps with that in that kind of area. But at the same time, um, it definitely made you invest in your students, invest because you know that these kids will like they will grow up and you want to work with them you know it's like you want them to be your colleagues and you want them to be uh you depend on them uh, and you rely the, on them so i think it's like uh, when we were younger there was no much of the the 
we were still young. There's no much of the community of the art community that we felt like it's solid and it's still um, and still we're trying to explore things now by time and seeing the arts community in Qatar is like it's more robust and we it's 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 solid comparing to like you know it's like when I when I came uh, way back in Qatar and I started as a student. Um, no, now you can see the crossover, you know, that's happening and it became, it made us more open to like cross and say that we don't know, let's collaborate, you know, so yeah, it's long. Okay, I have, a, but... I have a question for you. First of all, I have to say, I love the phrase, they trust my brain, which, which you said <laughs> earlier. Like, I want that on a t-shirt, trust my brain. You said something earlier, you said a phrase that um, I want to ask you about. You said a phrase, time-based media. Mm, yes. Can you describe what that, that means? Is that? <laughs> yeah, tell me, what is time-based media? Uh, time is time, you know? So, so my time is uh, any media that uses time. You know, it's like there is a, duration is part of the equation. And photography, every sort of media, if you look at it, it's like even writing, um, is related to time-based media. You know, it's like, so I, my studio is called Time Studio, which is awesome. You know, it's like, I am like, this is the, like, I can't even ask for more awesome name for like a studio, but it's, um, and we get to explore time. You know, it's like explore time digitally, um, analog way, uh, philosophically. It just think about why we need time. Uh, does it even exist? All of this is part of the conversations that happen in the classroom. And um, and even the artists that um, we follow and get influenced by and all of that. And it's like all the technologies are happening right now with like how um, machine learning is using time and versus the human brain and all of that. And just when you look at how time is used, it's like it adds a completely different like, you know, it's like a layer to your work and you start thinking about your concepts differently and um, and even why you're using the type of mediums and um, how time will change and how your audience will change since they experience your work and they leave. Even if it's just a matter of t like minutes, it's like what will change in that um, period. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's to, to tell you like what is time-based media. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's interesting is, um... This idea of uh, measuring time, right? Like the the name of this this series, right, is all about twenty five years, which is obviously a measurement of time. And I wonder if uh, measuring time in a place like Doha or a place like VCU Qatar feels different than measuring time in other places. Does twenty five years feel like twenty five years when you think about two thousand seven? Does it feel like fifteen years ago, or does it feel different? How do you measure time in a place like Doha? Yasmin, what about you? Let's start with you. Um, I mean, I think that's, a, for me, it's, a, I've, I've lived in Doha my whole life. I, I, was, I was raised here. And so I, actually a lot of my uh, kind of research interests, I think is, is a direct effect of, of living and growing up in a place like this because time gets sort of really, uh, um, warped like the the speed of of development of things and uh uh you you're packing a lot in very little time and so um which also plays around with this notion of what is permanent and was it what is impermanent and temporary and it's sort of the the kind of the the balance between these things uh as well as an interesting notion that i've always toyed with but in doha i feel like uh it's 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 sort of a lot happens in a very short amount of time. Everything feels like it's packed into a kind of like a pressure cooker. And so when you look back in time and you kind of measure all the things that have taken place over the course of a year, you really think like it's more like a span of two years, but it's like six months. Um, and I feel like that's how it's been uh, growing up in a, in, a, in a place like this. And as you're also growing and developing, you're also seeing the city grow and develop at the same time. And that adds to the kind of, uh, I think, um, sort of notion of everything kind of happening at, in such a short period of time. So uh, it's, a, it's a different pace. It's not to say that it's like fast paced or slow paced, but it's just 
how much is done in in the amount of time that it's done done within mm-hmm. is is I don't think normal. <laughs> yeah. When I uh, mm-hmm. yeah when I maybe compare it to other places, perhaps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is a different word for normal and healthy? Maybe, maybe in certain instances, yes. I feel like sometimes it's uh, it would be worthwhile to slow uh, to slow some things down to kind of have a little bit more uh, thoughtful reasoning, thoughtful kind of outcomes as a result, um, and, and, and instead of trying to uh, just make it to a particular man-made kind of deadline of sorts. Um, just for the sake of getting it done, and uh, I think yeah. I think in in some instances that would definitely be a, a a healthier a healthier kind of way about it. I was just gonna add, like you know, I think I think when you think about it through time, because it's it can seem a lot, but it's like for me, it's more like the impact. You know, mm-hmm. it's like what is the impact of this institution uh, for this context, and it's like. Because if you think about time as time, like, you know, it's like you can come and go and no one can remember you. <laughs> it's like, these are, like, this is like the reality of like why we exist, you know, it's like and why we build and why we want to contribute to our existence. So it's like impact is is what measures, you know, it's like maybe time and uh, measures like the milestones. And it's like it's like what did you contribute and what did you make? Uh, to have it like even exist and it can be timeless later, you know, it's like it doesn't have to be measured with time. Um, so, yeah, I think for me, just to see it as a question, like I would see Qatar or VCU or like what Tasmim has been doing throughout the time. I, I don't see it like I don't look back at it as a timeline. I see it as like events and mm-hmm. moments that resonates with me that affected you know, it's like, it reminds me why it actually started and why it exists and all of that. Yeah. This mean, your work, um, when you describe your work, um, I see you talk about permanence a lot, right? I wonder if you, if you are, you know, if you believe, you know, when you talk about preservation and permanence and legacy and stuff like that, to what extent do you think like quote unquote permanence is possible? Uh, I don't believe in that actually, and in in my research, I so like the the title of of my MFA thesis was adaptability in a state of flux, um, and and the flux is that flux between the permanence and the impermanence, or the permanence and temporality, and that's something that I've also been exploring within my own identity as a Palestinian who has grown outside of Palestine as well, and what that means and. Um, and even the notions of ter- of permanence and temporality in the context of Palestine, but also how that is extended into my reality of of growing up in a city like Doha, um, and then that's also sort of extended and gone through to my experience working with materials and um, and which is a very tactile, very tangible kind of reality, um, and in many ways both explorers you will have uh, materials that. Um, that express permanence, um, but everything has a sort of uh, expiry of sorts. You know, nothing lasts forever. Even uh, you know materials that perhaps we uh, we would see as being you know kind of can 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 withstand uh, many many years. You know, uh, everything sort of has uh, a timeline of sorts, and so it's um, I'm always sort of exploring these notions because they coexist. They cannot sort of, you cannot have permanence without temporality and vice versa. So, um, yeah, those are the kind of notions I, I look at. How do you guys, how, I'm curious about your relationships with your students, because both of you were students at VCU, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, like, in theory, your professors, when you were students, you know, could have said to you, you know, well, one day you will be co chairs. And one day you will be involved and you could have like rolled your eyes and been like, yeah, eh, probably not. Right. <laughs> but now when you say to your students, you both are sort of like walking examples of what it actually, I assume is like the best case scenario for a student, is which is to go as a student, become a super active alumni, become a practitioner in the field, get back involved professionally and contribute to this like growing pipeline. 
Um, so I'm curious, uh, Hadid, you mentioned it earlier about like working with your students and what is your relationship like with them? We still roll their eyes. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no it's, uh, listen, it's uh, it, like, it's, it's every day is a new experience and you kind of like enter with a plan and sometimes you're like, okay, from the windows, let's start over and let's figure out like what we're doing today. So you plan, you plan, you plan, but it's like, I don't know how you like you, you say this, but it's like raising kids or like you're like you have you're in a relationship with someone or whatever. You know, it's like you have to be super flexible and read the room and be sensitive with like how they learn. And again, I'm not a lecturer, so we don't go there and just give them the presentations and then off we go and we have discussions and we leave. Uh, we're studio based. So it's like a lot of the work that we do is based on uh, interactions and getting to depend on the person in front of you and getting to know who they are and what excites them and what what are their curiosities and they're like they're freshly like graduated from high school and they're coming to the university um, having some expectations but at the same time have zero expectations to like what is a, a you know like higher education is and so it's like you also you're kind of introducing them to that. So a lot of the conversations that I have, at least in my classroom, is is I'm a female, I'm Arab, technically young. You know, it's like there are things that it's like that it can, you know, is like can help out to kind of for them to relate. You know, like, you know, it's like why we like exist and uh, why we're like here and what we have to say. And it's like, um, um, how can we contribute? Um, so we try as much as we can to push that on them and at the same time uh, to make them trust themselves to to dig within some to find stories, uh, find interesting um, questions that they are curious to even question because a lot of the times they're coming thinking that they are, um, we have to spoon feed them, we have to give them the information, we have mm -hmm. to give them every single step, but it's like... Um, um, we were the way that we were taught and the way that we experience now how artists should be reacting to what's happening around them these days. I go in the classroom and I'm like, I'm not just your professor. I'm also a colleague. I'm your client. Sometimes I'm your boss. Sometimes I'm like, we have to be super flexible to give them that kind of experience uh, because I don't want them to wait until you graduate to face that, you know, it's like they get to meet their actual boss, meet their actual, you know, client, whatever. Um, so yeah, that's. Yeah. Just mean, are, is it similar for you? Do you, I mean, do you feel like you can still relate to what they're going through? Uh, yes and no. So the, the fun fact of working in academia is you keep getting older, but then the batch of students that comes in is always within the same age range, which you know, messes with your mind every now and then. So mm. in terms of uh, pop culture, probably not. But uh, I do still think that our experiences as students and within the context of the university um, is still relatable, uh, even though there's been a, a lot of changes within the university in terms of curriculum and professors and all of that. So that's... Um, inevitable in terms of the differences between our experiences, uh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I sort of agree with uh, Hadir in, in many ways. And, and maybe there's a difference. Uh, Hadir teaches the art foundation students, which are like fresh out of high school. I mostly teach MFA students, which are a different sort of age range um, and maybe a uh, uh, some questionable maturity yeah, yeah, yeah. level. <laughs> um, but it's always interesting when we have conversations. But I, I agree with Hadir, like I, I, I treat my students as colleagues. You know, I don't really have this. Um, I don't I don't sort of um, apply a professor student kind of authoritarian. I hold the knowledge and you're meant to be the vessel that absorbs this knowledge. It's It's not like that at all. And uh, and in many ways, what's so gratifying about teaching is that actually we're learning as much as these students are from their experiences and and from the conversations and the discussions that we have with them. So 
it's a very reciprocal relationship. It's it's definitely not one sided. Yeah. What do you think some of the sort of broader challenges facing the design world as an industry are now um, that your students are going to have to deal with that might be different than from some of the things that you had to deal with as you entered the profession, you know, 15 years ago? Um, I would say that it's more than ever self-branding became a huge part of your selling point of whatever you want to do. It's just like if you are creating something and whatever is the idea is and you're like in on like in the backstage and you're putting your product or your design or your idea, whatever, it has to be super good to compete by itself and not have a face. That's my issue with it, that it's like nowadays it's like I see a lot of work or a lot of um, brands have to have a face or have to have, I don't know, a singer or something. You know, it's like someone that has to be, you know, it's like the the founder, or whatever, just to kind of like and use that self-branding uh, to push it. And I'm seeing artists are going through the same thing. I'm seeing it's in every single sector right now, and um, which is, I, I'm up for it. I'm okay with it, but I'm just saying that it's a challenge that when we were younger, social media was not the same. Mm. Um, the net, the whole internet was not the same. So it's like now you have to like, um, from the beginning, you're doing marketing strategies that it's full on, you know, it's like, yeah, you have to have the budget for it. You have, and the um, plus content and plus good story and very, you know, it's like you're, you're, interested in spreading it out throughout all the platforms and all mediums. So um, that's one challenge that I see. I see a lot of challenges, but that's what's for me is particularly is uh, an interesting one. Yeah. Yes, me, what about you? Yeah, I think this one, that one is a, is honestly a huge one because it was a, I mean, social media and, you know, the, the blowing up of that was a huge game changer in the industry. Um, I also think, and, and it's interesting because it's both a, a blessing and a curse. And in the same way, I think the, um, the divergence also of the industry. So it's a lot more kind of, you're, you're having a lot more kind of interdisciplinary, you know, interdisciplinary designers, programs, um, firms, studios. So having a designer no longer having to sort of specialize in a particular field, but having the kind of liberty to uh, bounce around and stretch uh, their kind of interests is both a blessing and a curse because in a lot of ways um, it's it's a blessing in the sense that you're able to sort of tap into multiple interests that you can have but in a lot of ways I and I hear students kind of expressing this and alumni as well but you know where do we fit where do we belong you know when someone asks you so what is it exactly that you do that's a really hard question to answer yeah um, and especially Disastrous. when you're in a market that, yeah, and especially when you're in a market that perhaps hasn't gotten to that stage where that kind of interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity is the common or is the kind of the majority of how the kind of the industry works and, and fits where you still have highly specialized um, fields and, and positions. So I think that's still... Um, that's still a challenge that a lot of uh, even us have to battle with every now and then. Um, but it's also an opportunity. And I think that's the, the reality of having social media and having now the ability to, to sort of, or the impetus to sort of, well, if you're not happy with how the industry is, do your own thing. That is also both a blessing and a curse because it's not so easy. It's not so easily done as well in certain in certain situations or in certain contexts. Um, but also to have the ability to be able to do that is is also a blessing as well. So yeah, yeah. So if you think about the industry, you were talking about the industry sort of not necessarily being fully matured, right? Um, and maybe it's not cooked on all sides yet. In what ways? What are some of the sides, sides, so to speak, that are not fully cooked? And what role do you think Tasmeem could play in actually helping cook those sides? And what things 
can they not help with? It's just like, listen, this is beyond our purview. This is beyond our scope. We can't, as an institution, be expected to cook those things. Mm. Yes, me, Nordo, I'm going to leave you with this. Um, I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind is that I think, and, and this is, I don't, I don't think this is sort of exclusive to, to how the industry is just in like in, in Qatar or, or, uh, or in, in Doha in particular, but I've always felt that within the art and design sector, there's a lot of exclusivity, you know, it's a small mm. circle or small circles of people and they're the same people and it's a very tight community. And I feel if I were someone who didn't belong to that circle or who wasn't part of a circle from those, um, I would feel very alienated. And so I feel the general public in, you know, um, in general or the majority of them don't really understand what it is that we do because we, we keep them out of the conversation. We're not the most welcoming. We may not always be the most welcoming spaces. Um, and so I feel like that is something that, I mean, and, and that was something when, when we uh, co-chaired Tasmim along with Wajiha and Noha, that was something that we really cared for is how could we make this inclusive? How could we make this welcoming for um, my father or like my uncle or my cousin who has no idea what it is that I do on a day-to-day -day basis to come in and to still enjoy and take something out of an event like that? Mm -hmm. And so I feel that is something that uh, I still feel should be a responsibility, especially since we are an embedded in an educational institution, you know, like Tasmeem. Um, I feel like that is the responsibility of an, ev of an event like that, that it extends its sort of hands more to the public um, and caters more to the public in that way and is a lot more um, inclusive in that sense, where it's it's breaking through those kind of circles and uh and and in broadening that circle basically. So and I and I feel ultimately that is going to be a win-win situation for all of us in the community because that way you're heightening the awareness of the public to what art and design is. And as you're heightening the awareness, you're also uh, increasing their understanding of of value and our value as artists and designers to the community. And I think that's really important. Hadid, what about you? I, I agree completely because it's like that was the first thing that I like I was like, okay, maybe it's a challenge that like Tasmin can't really fix the whole idea of like the public awareness and you know it's like the art education and all of that. Um and is that a problem before like, you keep on going? Before you keep on going, I have a question about just if you can add on what Yasmin was saying. Is the public awareness a problem because more people, including this means uncle and father and cousin, should know about this stuff. It should be an open door. Or is it a problem because these people should also be clients and they should also be users and they should also like uh, be colleagues and employees? Like, why is that a problem worth fixing? I think because also they're we're excluding just to kind of like be uh, general here, but it's like we're excluding. Um, so many art ways of, you know, it's like expressing ourselves. You know, it's like maybe we're talking about art and design, but there is music, there is dance, there is performance. There is so many ways of expressing art. There is like, I was listening to uh, like um, this podcast the other day and they were talking if shabby music, you know, it's like in Egypt is like art or not, you know, it's like, and they were like, debating because it's like there or like the the banana with the with the tape is it or you know it's like what is happening here you know it's like so it's uh and that kind of and that kind of awareness of like are we are we accepting all sorts of arts and we're not excluding some and mm. this comes back to what you were saying of like the exclusivity because if the group of people decided that this is art and this is how we experience it and this is what we're going to provide you, you know, it's like, and we're going to consider it art comparing to other things that we're going to exclude and we're not going to have shabby music in our university. You know, it's like, so you're excluding, you know, it's like a group of people that they think that this is art and this is what their taste is and all of that. So I think, um, and I'm not talking about, again, Qatar. I think it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, global problem because yeah. it's like you see it's, a, it's such a niche 
And when you go to events and you go to the same people, go to the same events, and we talk about the same problems everywhere. And when we tackle newer problems, like, for example, the metaverse and all of that, we're all talking with the same language. We're all talking with, we were even thinking the same ideas and asking the same questions as if it's like we, we took a script before coming to this event. So it's like, can we change that? Can we have different kind of people to reflect on it and see it from their own experiences? They don't have to be artists, but they're our clients and they are our audience. You're not making art for yourself. You're not making design for yourself. So don't be sad when they don't show up and they don't buy your stuff. You know, it's like because you're not really talking to them. You're talking to yourself, basically, and your people. So I think that's that's something that we're all facing right now. And sure, let's have all these events. Let's have um, a social metaverse world that we all hang out and we have artists and people that they can come there and like experience all of these and have these kind of conversations. But if it's still going to be exclusive and it's going to be uh, one way of discussing it or giving the validation that this is the right information or whatever, um, I think we're not going to go anywhere. It's interesting. Okay. Um, one last question to wrap up. What is a single memory from any past test memes, whether it's the ones you co-chaired or ones you attended as a student or ones that you attended as a staff, that is the most memorable moment or just a, a moment that just cracks you up thinking of like <laughs> i have a lot <laughs> we've gone through many toss memes yeah yeah exactly. really tough ask Mike. yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's so many like we like like ajib was ajib you know it's like there's so many interesting yeah ones with casey nice that wearing my t-shirt my design or something like that, that was in 2015. And Casey Neistat was at that point, it was like blowing up the internet. So for yeah. me, that was cool. And then, um, I don't know. And then our Tosmim was so weird because we were doing these weird in interventions and like, you know, building like experiences in the middle. So I remember we had people like sitting in her library, making things, you know, it's like, and like, you know, it's like people in the atrium uh, working on like putting in sofas. I just know I felt like it's a family business kind of like, it felt like it didn't feel like a conference conference. It felt like, you know, it's like whenever you go and look at people and you feel like you love these people and they're helping you and they're supporting. I don't know. There was so much love around and you felt like they really cared about having that event to happen and succeed and i think that's the energy that this usually brings and we all like miss because it's like we're such a small community but at the same time we all are a bunch of makers and we want to have fun so you end up having all these people coming and pitching in and wanting to help even if they don't know what the hell they're doing they're just gonna help and support so it's uh we miss it when it doesn't happen or because of these moments. Yeah, Hikayat as a as a whole experience of like organizing it, I, I will lump some it into like one super memorable one. But as a student, sure. I think for me a standout um a standout moment for me was attending, I think it was in two thousand and nine. Uh, I remember listening to um a Saudi architect. He was called Sami Angawi, a very known uh Saudi architect, but for for a younger me who uh, had gone through Western education her whole life, this was one of the very first examples of seeing an Arab Muslim man uh, talk about architecture um, and talk about it in a way that resonated with me so deeply that I still remember what he exactly said that has sort of struck a chord with me. Um, and I remember so, that... What did he say? Um, he was asked a question about something related to his creations. And I remember the first thing that he answered with was um, him saying, I'm not a creator, you know, that God is the only creator. And I was like, <laughs> and it was really profound because I'd never had an example of someone who embedded their spirituality and their, pra and their practice together. And um, that had a lasting impression on me uh, and sort of, 
made me realize how much I was sort of missing in my own kind of um, understanding and uh, my own kind of training and education that I had to sort of fill in those gaps. And that was sort of one of the trigger trigger moments for me. And yeah, so that was a lasting memory. Amazing. For sure. How oh, amazing yeah. is that? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, well, thank you both for being a part of the, the series. I have known about both of you for a long time and we've obviously we've met. Um, but yeah, I think you both embody this the Tasmim success story very, very well because you're both so full circle and you're so generous and creative. And so yeah, I'm always really, really happy that we got to do this. Thanks, Mikey. Yeah, thank Likewise. Thank you.